Good afternoon. My name is Rick Bovey from IBM Research. And today I'd like to talk to you about our paper on the scalability of heap check. My co-authors are Guru Raj, Tong, Ben, and Alper. And this paper is all about memory safety. As we mentioned in a previous paper, memory safety bugs like buffer overflow and use after free are a serious problem and have been at the root of many security problems for more than three decades. Existing solutions for enforcing memory safety have poor coverage or high performance overhead or required disruptive changes. Our solution combines hardware and software in a way that allows for precise bounds checking that is minimally invasive, requiring no changes to source code and no changes to binary layout, which is important for retaining compatibility with existing libraries. And we do this with minimal performance impact. As we discussed last year, uh, some of our results included the fact that we detected all the vulnerabilities and prevented all the attacks in the How to Heap exploit suite. And we also detected 87 memory safety bugs in glibc and in the SPEC CPU 2017 benchmark programs that to our knowledge had not been previously detected. One nice thing about our design is we can detect and prevent bugs in unmodified, uninstrumented code in shared libraries. Uh, so in today's talk, we extend what we presented last year to be able to support very large numbers of active objects concurrently, more than 16 million, while at the same time preserving the heap check benefits of precise rather than probabilistic detection of memory safety errors. Again, with low overhead, 1.5% overhead on average, and again, with no changes to source code or binary layout. Um, we also uh, did some comparisons to other memory safety approaches in our previous paper. Uh, and in today's talk, we also compare our approach to two additional approaches that have been announced in the last year. In our design, we use some of the unused bits in a 64-bit pointer. And note, there are unused bits typically because very few programs use two to the 64 bytes of address space. So we use some of those unused bits to store metadata and in this case, it's an index into a bounds information table so that when a pointer is dereferenced, we can determine if a, if a reference is in bounds or out of bounds uh, by basically using that index into our bounds information table to make that comparison. Um, the next slide really takes us through the life cycle of a pointer to a object in the heap. Uh, when malloc is used to allocate a new object, Basically, we take the base address of the object and the size of the object, and we take that information and store it in an entry in our bounds information table. And then we embed the index to that entry in the bounds table into the top bits of the pointer that we return from the malloc call. Later, when the pointer is used in a load or store operation, basically the hardware is going to take that index take the information from our bounds information table and determine if the reference is in bounds or out of bounds. Uh, still later on, when an object is deleted, we're going to basically, after ensuring that the, the free is valid, we're going to invalidate that particular entry in the bounds information table so that we can detect problems like uh, use after free problems. A <clears throat> uh, couple of nice things about this scheme is we have minimal performance impact since the bounds information flows automatically without extra instructions when a pointer is assigned to another, passed in a function call, or used to compute another address in array indexing or pointer arithmetic. That is, whenever a pointer value is used in one of these operations, uh, assignments, function call passing, and so forth, that index passes automatically without any extra instructions. And then, since all the addresses within a given buffer and all the pointers to that buffer have the same index, the bounds information for an address is often available in an on-chip bounds information cache. And the combination of these two uh, properties allows us to have very low performance overhead, 1.5% overhead. Now, one limitation of this approach is in the number of allocated objects that can be concurrently active. So if we have a 64-bit pointer, and we use 24 bits for the index information into our bounds table, and the other 40 bits as real addressing information, that allows us to have support for one terabyte of address space in a program, and it allows us to support uh, two to the 24 minus one objects in a process. 
So in this talk, we discuss how heap check can be used when the number of concurrently active objects exceeds the number that can be supported in the in available index bits. <clears throat> so we have this concept of an overflow table, which we're going to use when the entries don't fit in our regular bounds information table. But as long as the number of active objects is less than or equal to two to the 24 minus two, everything works as previously described, since we're going to reuse entries in our bounds information table when an object is free. But if a malloc would make the number of act active objects greater than two to the 24 minus two, uh, we're going to use a special value in the index bits of a pointer, uh, the all ones value to indicate that um, this object may be stored in the bounds information in, in the overflow table. We also use this notion of bounds information registers so that we can reduce the need to access information from this overflow table. And the bounds information registers are used as shown here. So when a load is done from an address in GPR3, and the CPU hardware is going to use bounds information register three to determine if the load is in bounds or out of bounds. And these bounds information registers are also going to propagate bounds information automatically when one pointer is assigned to another passed in a function call or used to compute another address in array indexing or pointer arithmetic. So for example, if an address in GPR three is used to compute an address in GPR five in array indexing, for example, then BI three will be automatically copied to BI five. Now, when a pointer is stored in memory, bounds information may have to be stored in the overflow table. So for example, if GPR6 is a pointer that is stored in memory at address X and GPR6 has the all ones value in its index bits, then the values of X and the value in BI6 is going to be stored in our overflow table. And as we said here, the overflow table is a hash table and the bucket used is based on a hash of address X. Later, when the pointer at address X is loaded into GPR7, say, BI7 will be loaded from the entry in the overflow table corresponding to address X. So for example, when a pointer with the all ones index is loaded into GPRI from memory address X, we're going to use hash bucket X to find the entry for X in the overflow table and take the bounds information there and load that into bounds information I. Now, when an object is freed via a pointer that has the all ones index value, the free may have to free entries in our overflow table and it may need to free information in bounds information registers. So, each BI register with bounds information for the freed object is set to no valid bounds information. Then if a pointer in GPRI is used in a load or store, and if BII contains the no valid bounds information value, an invalid address exception is generated. A free of an object with the all ones index value frees all overflow table entries for pointers to that object. So as shown here, when an object with bounds information Y is freed, a hash of Y is used to find and free the entries in the overflow table corresponding to bounds information Y. So all those entries will be freed as well as the entries in the bounds information registers. Then later on, if a pointer with the all ones index value is loaded from address X into GPRI, and there is no overflow table entry for X, BI I is loaded with no valid bounds information. We also make a change to malloc in this scheme. When malloc allocates an object and the number of active objects is greater than uh, that uh, two to the 24 minus two, then malloc is going to store the bounds information in an appropriate BI register before returning the pointer to the newly allocated object. So for example, if the return value from malloc is stored in GPR zero say, we're going to store the bounds information for this newly allocated object in BI zero, if this is one of these cases where uh, the number of objects exceeds the two to the 24 minus two, and we're gonna store the all ones value in the index bits. Um, 
uh, one, one chart about performance. So the approach that we described here um, provides the efficiency advantages previously discussed for up to 16,777,214 active objects. And it uses these BI registers to reduce the need to access bounds information from the overflow table for objects beyond that number. Now in the SPEC CPU 2017 benchmark suite, those applications don't use anywhere near 16 million active objects and heap checks performance overhead across these benchmarks as discussed previously is 1.5%. Another paper analyze real world applications, including Apache, MySQL, and others, and showed that while these applications use a very large number of objects, they only use a few thousand objects concurrently. And if most real world applications are like this, the overflow table will rarely be used and our performance will be similar to the 1.5% uh, overhead that we discussed previously. And this is a, a reference to the paper that uh, I mentioned above. Um, now, heat check can also be used for fuzz testing, where fuzz testing is an automated testing technique that provides a program under test with invalid or um, uh, unexpected or unexpectedly long randomly generated inputs. So buffer overflow and other memory safety bugs can be trapped, debugged, and fixed at development and test time prior to deployment. And the question uh, might be raised, why do fuzz testing if we have a good time, a good runtime solution? One answer is because it's better to catch and fix bugs during development and test than it is to generate an interrupt and halt execution in production. Now, one might ask why use heap check for fuzz testing since we have tools like address sanitizer. And the one answer to that is because heap check can catch bugs that ASAN cannot. So, uh, an out of bounds reference, for example, that misses its red zone or a bug that manifests itself in some out of unmodified, uninstrumented code like the string functions in glibc. Furthermore, ASAN has significant performance overhead, 1.73 times slowdown. And since heat check provides precise hardware assisted memory safety protection with only 1.5% overhead, heat check can increase the throughput of fuzz testing and provide better coverage. Uh, why use heap check at runtime if we have tools for fuzz testing? Uh, answer, because fuzz testing may not catch every bug. And this is a reference to uh, address sanitizer. So there have been a couple of uh, industry efforts announced in the last year that also address this uh, problem of memory safety. One was in a paper that Intel presented on cryptographic capability computing. Uh, interestingly, this approach does not actually prevent out-of-bounds accesses. What it does do is it uses cryptography to ensure that an out-of-bounds load loads garbled data and an out-of-bounds store stores garbled data. Uh, the former prevents an adversary from using an out-of-bounds load to steal sensitive information as in Heartbleed. And the latter prevents an adversary from using an out-of-bounds store to inject data chosen by the adversary into a program as in return-oriented programming. But this may introduce other problems, including unpredictable program behavior, and may be hard to debug. By contrast, heap check prevents out-of-bounds accesses and generates an interrupt at the point of an out-of-bounds access. So out-of-bounds accesses can be more easily identified, debugged, and fixed. Um, also, uh, ARM announced a prototype SOC with enhanced security capabilities. Um, and as I discuss here, uh, this is a result of their Morello research initiative. And they announced in January that they hit a new milestone in next-gen security. And they're making an ARM-based SOC and demonstrator board available that uh, is based on the University of Cambridge's Cherry architecture. Now, um, as we discussed in our 2021 paper, fat pointer-based solutions, including Cherry, store the bounds information in a separate word alongside the actual pointer value. So a bounds check can be done when a pointer is dereferenced. But this increases the size of pointers, which can negatively impact performance by reducing the amount of other data that fits in a cache. And it also requires changes to a program's binary layout that is not compatible with existing libraries and system calls. 
And unless some additional mechanism is introduced, fat pointer-based solutions cannot protect against temporal problems such as use after free bucks. By contrast, our approach doesn't have any of these disadvantages. So in summary, uh, we presented an extension of our 2021 paper, uh, which protects against memory safety bugs like buffer overflow, use after free. And in this current paper, we extended our approach to accommodate very large numbers of dynamically allocated erased drugs. We also compared our approach to two recently announced approaches from Intel and ARM. And we believe that our approach has advantages over other approaches and can provide an effective, low cost, easy to deploy solution that can protect software from an important problem that has existed for more than 30 years. So that's what we wanted to uh, present today. And I wanted to thank you for your time.